Welcome back to Goliath. We're doing another video here today about Thread and how you can use Goliath to do device management for your Thread devices. With me is Veet, our CTO. Veet, what are we going to be talking about with Thread and what is Thread? Yeah, uh, with Thread, I think the challenging thing is how to get started because you need a couple of pieces of hardware, a couple of pieces of software. Most of it, it's open source there are a lot of guides out there how to get the network set up but then once you have the network set up running you still need to get goliath running on top of that and i think that's what i would really like to cover today how to get okay. goliath and rsdk running on top of a thread network with a border router yeah, so let's take a look at your setup here. So you were able to do this with some low cost components for from a prototyping perspective. Can you walk us through what these individual elements are? Sure. So I had a bunch of the Nordic NRF 52840 uh, USB dongles laying around and I tried to get as far as possible just with them without using you know the dev kit or any kind of more expensive hardware. Uh, so, um, the goal was to set up the border router uh, on top of a Raspberry Pi. So uh, Raspberry Pi with the hardware it has on board, it cannot really talk the physical layer of uh, thread, which is 802.15.4. So in order to get the 802.15.4 layer running, I needed to have uh, a NRF52 dongle in the USB port of the Raspberry Pi. But otherwise, it's just a completely regular Raspberry Pi. And um, on top of that, uh, there is then some some software, basically open thread software running uh, on, on top of that. So the dongle that's in the Raspberry Pi needs to be running a specific uh, firmware that you can get or compile on your own from open thread. It's called the RCP, unless I'm swapping letters. Basically, it's a firmware that communicates over a serial over USB, but in a binary protocol, it's basically a layer between the host CPU on the Raspberry Pi and the radio front end. And it bridges the 802.15.4 layer to the Raspberry Pi, uh, Pi CPU. Um, the other three things that are sitting in my USB hub are also the USB dongles. And I use them for different purposes. So for the purpose of this demo, there will be just the one where you can see the green LED kind of lighting up. Uh, that's the one that I'm running and the green LED indicates that it's connected uh, to the thread network. Uh, that is running um, a Zephyr powered uh, open thread network or firmware together with our SDK. The other dongles I use just to debug the network, basically one of them is running a sniffer firmware so that I can see the packets that are coming over the air and uh, debug problems with the network on, really the, on the air. And the other dongle I really just used uh, with the default firmware uh, from OpenThread, yeah. just to compare. Like a sanity contrast. check, kind of. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. All right, let's take a step back. And so uh, the when you're talking about Thread, there, so it's all running on the 2.4 gigahertz radio, right? So that's the frequency it runs on. Then the protocol, protocol, is that right? The 802.15.4. And then yeah. Thread it's... is on top of that, that. And that's basically like a software stack, kind of like, Bluetooth is, right? Yeah, yeah. So let me maybe outline what the utility is of all of all of those layers. So on the physical layer, uh, we do have the 2.4 gigahertz uh, hardware, but uh, the 802.15.4 actually specifies even 900 megahertz and you can run on, uh, yeah, different spectrum than two, the 2.4. Uh, it is very similar to bluetooth on the physical layer but the channel widths are different there is different number of channels there is no channel hopping uh it's 
very, very simpler uh, than Bluetooth. But because it's so similar, you can actually coexist Bluetooth and uh, the 802.15.4 physical layer on the same chip and time duplex them. So if you want Bluetooth and thread at the same on the same device, it's definitely possible with the same hardware. Uh, the 802.15.4 layer creates kind of like a peer-to-peer -peer link. It doesn't give you a lot of routing or advanced networking setups. So if you just want to talk device to device, you could theoretically do that on 802.15.4. But once you want to set up like larger networks with multiple devices and routing and mesh networks, that's where Thread is adding all of that additional functionality, IPv6 addressing, all of that is living kind of on the layer above. Right, so that actually allows it to then, so each of the USB, sorry, the, the, the Zephyr-based USB dongle and the OpenThread-based USB dongle, they actually have IP addresses. So you could, in theory, reach each one of them from the internet because it's getting routed through the Raspberry Pi out to the USB dongle, which is acting as the, gate, well, not the gateway, but the, the modem basically out to the physical layer, which is the 2.4 gigahertz to talk these other things. But that's why it is an internet device at this point, or it's got an IP address, right? Yeah, and that's the beauty of uh, Thread, that with a very inexpensive device like the 802, uh, with the NRF52840. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, a lot of numbers, a lot of numbers here that we're dealing with, yeah. You can, uh, yeah, you can get an IPv6 address and like a full-fledged, internet device where a lot of you know routers and way more expensive hardware does not do ipv6 or cannot do ipv6 so it's pretty right. pretty one thing one thing i always think about is like you know a lot of the devices that people see in iot type de deployments and things like that they always you know you think like a bluetooth and the bluetooth device by itself is pretty cool but then they're like oh by the way that has to be talking to a phone and so you have this like very expensive you know android linux based device you know, iOS, whatever. And that's really doing all the heavy lifting. It's got a huge battery on it. And, you know, now obviously there is, there is some brains here, but it's for a wider range of things that might be connected to it. So the border router in this case is a Raspberry Pi, Linux based device plugged into the wall, but the little individual devices actually have IP addresses. And so you can still access them, which allows us to use it with Goliath. Yeah, and also with a lot of existing applications, right? Like, so if you are running your devices on top of Wi-Fi or cellular, the firmware that you are using for them is probably IP-based. So if you switch to Thread, you don't really need to do that many changes because it's an IP-powered networking stack. Whereas if you wanted to change to like Bluetooth or LoRa, your networking stack or your application would probably need to change quite a bit to adapt to the networking stack of those those technologies. So this is a great, right. yeah, great added value. Right. Not to mention that because you're building with Zephyr, because you're building with Goliath SDK, basically that switch between them is somewhat minimal, right? Because it is the same type of firmware, but now targeting a different device, targeting a different network interface. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the portability, oh, definitely. Uh, and added, yeah. added thing. And though, you know, we are demonstrating today on top of the NRF52, any other hardware that supports open thread on Zephyr basically should be able to run out of the box. Oh. Right. It's pretty magical. All right, let's see this in action. Okay. So you have, you have this running on your machine and you actually are SSH'd into that Raspberry Pi as well. Could you just tell us what you we're looking at here? Yeah, so on the left side of the screen, I have the SSH console of the Raspberry Pi. So I just wanted to show you all the kinds of networking that's happening on the Raspberry Pi and why it's a little more challenging to set up the border router than, than the device. So the shell on the right is the, is the Zephyr shell of the, of the, and the device. Uh, so on the left, uh, let me refresh the IF config. There is a bunch of stuff happening. Uh, so yeah. let me start with, uh, let's say, uh, the uh, um, the VLAN zero, right? So VLAN zero is uh, for the purposes of this demo, uh, the internet interface of the Raspberry Pi. So my Raspberry Pi is connected to my home Wi-Fi, 
and that's the way how it can uh, reach the internet uh, it reaches internet over ipv4 the e it has ipv6 addresses but as you see those are basically just local uh non-internet ipv6 addresses so the vlan zero interface is ipv4 interface uh, then we have the wpan the vpan uh zero interface which is the thread interface so this is uh the interface that's associated to the nrf52 and is assigned a bunch of ipv6 addresses and some of those are link local addresses some of them are mesh routing addresses basically all of them are somewhat related to all the magic that thread is is doing with its routing and multi-hop networking and all of that mm -hmm. so i will not so go we'll do a little bit of a little bit of hand waving right now and saying it yeah. works for right you know like we'll get into that in future videos and articles hopefully but uh but for right now we're just gonna say it works <laughs> yeah and the nice thing is if you run the open thread or follow the open thread guides uh, you really just execute a couple of commands and this will all be set up for you automatically you don't need to understand it you don't need to tweak it it will just be there and will be working out of the box if everything goes well the challenging point or uh, where I had a bit of trouble following the uh, guides on the internet uh, was setting up this NAT64 interface. And uh, why I need this interface is because Thread speaks IPv6. And as I explained, my internet connection is IPv4. So in order for my Thread devices to reach the internet, they would need to talk ipv4 but thread does not support ipv4 so we need to have a translation layer between the ipv6 and the ipv4 world and that's what this net 64 is doing i have been hearing about IV ipv6 for years and years and i've been surprised that the world hasn't switched over yet you know they talk about how many more ip addresses are out there and everything but yeah every Every server rights provision is still IPv4 and, you know, like there are other things available, but it just doesn't seem like it's commonplace yet. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And as you see, my internet service provider, even after I asked a couple of times, uh, they still say, <laughs> we are working on it. Doing, huh? Close, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Close. Got it. So, uh, so when that does happen, when that switches over and assuming your, your home networking setup is also set up for it, that interface layer wouldn't be required anymore. Yeah, basically if. If you had an IPv6 network, this layer would not be needed. What you would need to set up is some additional networking, basically routing uh, mm -hmm. options so that the uh, VLAN here interface is bridged over to the VPAN zero Got interface, it. but that's just a couple of Linux kernel options. Got it. I feel like another thing we should mention here is that you are running a border router right now. You have this kind of DIY border router using the setup from OpenThread, but there are commercially available border routers and more coming online. Uh, and so people might be able to skip this step entirely and just provision a thread device using Zephyr or using OpenThread. And still that, well, if they're using Zephyr, then they can connect right into the Goliath SDK through an external uh, border router, like a third party one. Absolutely. So if you are able to get your hands on an off the shelf thread uh, border router, this you can forget about the left side of my screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So probably not for your home thing. setup. So for now, we got to do this. But uh, yeah, uh, it still allows us to get some interesting educational stuff for the, the people out there watching right now. Yeah. And one thing I forgot to mention is that this. Uh, OpenThread uh, software actually has a web UI. So uh, if you want to have a slightly more convenient display of all of what's going on, there is the status page uh, of this um, web UI that tells you a bit more about the IP addresses and all the network setup and, and the details. And these but not last, this also, also shows you the network topology 
where it's pretty simple right, right now <laughs> but that's, no, it's straightforward that's, that's true yeah. but uh yeah as you add more and more dongles this this might get a bit more uh a bit more complex so yeah great so that's the left side of the screen uh on the right side of the screen is uh, is the device that's actually being connected, uh, and uh, what I compiled or I prepared this uh, this image with particular options, so uh, you don't get just the Goliath SDK, but you get some extra sh Zephyr shell commands that help you understand what the network is doing. So, one of the commands is uh, hiding in the net set of commands that would give you the ipv6 information and uh this would then let you do things like pinging so if we wanted to uh before we you know dive into what you do on the goliath level i could show you a ping between uh the zephyr device and my border router Oh, I haven't really planned for this, but... Uh, All right, live demo. Let's see, let's see. So uh, for convenience, uh, I'll copy paste the mesh local address. So this is an address that you would be only able to reach if the mesh networking is actually working. If there are like multiple hops of... Or our, tech, our topology is fairly simple, but basically... It demonstrates that the mesh networking is working. So with net ping and this IP address, we should get a response and we are getting a response. All right. Look at that. With yeah. no packets. I mean, that's dropped. the thing, and it it just looks like a network address now. Like this is something you would do anytime you're messing with the network. So that's great. The more yeah. it feels like a regular network, the better off we're gonna be, I think. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you see, you know, the IP address of this interface. Yeah, it's it's all there. Right. So, so the net local you're doing that was the IP address of the border router, not of the device. Uh, so yeah, let me clarify. So I'm pinging the border router on the four F three F ending address. Four F three F, and uh. I'm getting a response to my ping from 4F3F to my IPv6 address of this yep. device. So that's, that's this. It's this device. Um, so how do we then tool. take this and uh, and roll this into Goliath? Then, so how do we how can we tell whether or not this is connected to Goliath and uh, using using the features of Goliath? Yeah. So right now we don't have any shell command that would tell you we are connected or not connected um let me see i could restart the device and start from scratch but maybe before i do that as it's more risky let me uh let me show you what it can do out of the box right now so uh what we have is a synchronized uh log between the zephyr logging infrastructure uh we are bridging that through the goliath sdk and send are sending all the log events to uh goliath so you'll see that there are some historical uh events here in the log that i previously uh, created but i do have a button on the nrf52 uh, that I can press and it would generate a log event in uh, in Zephyr and send those log events directly to to Goliath. So let me press the button. We should you should turn on the uh, the refresh first, the the auto refresh on the on the Ooh. logs. There we go. That way we could see it, you know, live. <laughs> All right. Every second a refresh. And maybe let me narrow this down so that we actually see everything. Uh, so I'm pressing the button now. And it said the button right. changed from being pressed to back to not being pressed. And some events arrived to Goliath. 
it looked near instantaneous and there is no no movie magic here but uh <laughs> yeah it's hard yeah. you know it's hard to show this stuff when it's just text but yeah it is uh it is magic when it happens in person so we'll encourage people to to build their own setups after after this yeah so i can try and enter the more dangerous ground and ask the device to reboot and reconnect to the thread network and see how that displays on the log um, okay so i need my help but i believe kernel kernel gives me the option to reboot and i can do a warm reboot let me see so my firmware is configured in a way that it waits for the usb serial to actually connect back so the moment i connect oh, back fine. to the usb we should be seeing something happening that's great Look All at those right. events coming in. <laughs> right. So, and this is because much like in other Zephyr programs, the Zephyr logging system is tied to the Goliath logging system. So all of these Zephyr logs that are be being pushed out to your serial console are also configured to hook up to the, the network as well. That's right. That's right. So from That's the great. moment, the network is connected and uh, the Goliath client connects to the backend, you'll start seeing the um, the events coming in. So you can see some of the log events saying waiting for host to be ready to communicate, which means there is still some uh, setting up happening behind the scenes. And once the USB has been connected, the rest of it follows quite quickly and you get, you get the events. That's great. All right, so it seems like uh, because we're connected to Goliath and much like we already have logging and we're using thread, that we would also have uh, things like LightDB state, LightDB stream and DFU and things like that because it's just another IP device. Is that is that correct? Right, yeah. So the networking stack under, under the hood comes to the same place. Like you just need a DTLS connection to the Goliath backend. So absolutely everything that sits on top of that uh would work just the same as the logging so lightdb stream lightdb state would work just as well as what we just shown on the logs awesome well i'm really excited to see more thread devices using goliath for for device management for firmware updates for all of the ease that uh, goliath happens out there connecting to the internet and making data flow back easier. It seems like this is a, a really good fit between Thread and our device management solution. I agree. All right. Well, thanks, Pete. I'm looking forward to future videos and demos and, and uh, things we'll have out on the blog and here on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Chris.